Hi guys, and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you enjoy these kinds of videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button guys so you don't miss any future videos. Today's case was requested by Giselle Brooks. So thank you so much for bringing this case to my attention. I used to love horror movies and I still kind of do, but I am still scared of that movie. Like. A couple days after watching it, especially when I was younger. Now, after having kids, I really try not to watch horror movies because my son comes into my room sometimes in the middle of the night and it scares the crap out of me, so I just can't do it anymore. But one of my favorite, and I am guessing one of like the cult classics, is Jeepers Creepers. I mean, that movie was so scary back in the day, and who doesn't love Justin Long? But now when I watch it again, I was kind of like, oh, it's not that scary, but still pretty scary. Now, if you don't know this movie, it's about a brother and a sister and they're driving home after spring break together and they're in the car and they're playing this license plate game where they make up words and sentences from license plates around them. So as they're driving down this lonely road, this truck comes up behind them driving super aggressively and the license plate on this truck is beating you. And they just let this truck pass after like a scary encounter. Later, as they're driving, they see the same truck parked at an abandoned church and the driver of the truck seems to be sliding bloodied sheets, possibly wrapped around something, down this like big pipe. And then as they're watching him do this, suddenly the driver like locks eyes with them and then eventually gets in his car and starts chasing them. Then the two of them end up going back to that abandoned church because they want to know what this guy was doing at this pipe. And then the real horror begins. So when I checked today's case out and I found out that it was apparently inspired by this guy, I was shocked to know that such a gruesome horror movie was based on the possible actions of a real person is wild. Let's dive into the case of Dennis Depew. Dennis Henry Depew was born on June 13th, 1943 in Michigan in the United States. He was the son of Claude and Elma Depew. I don't believe he had any siblings, none that I could find anyway. Dennis graduated from Burr Oak High School and received a bachelor's degree in business education from the Michigan State University. After graduation, he pretty much dived straight into working for the state of Michigan in the Department of Treasury as a property tax specialist. He also briefly worked teaching business education in Portland, Oregon, as well as in Los Angeles in California. But for most of his life, he lived in Michigan, he worked as the property tax specialist, he was religious. He attended the Burr Oak United Methodist Church and he was also a member of the MSU Alumni Association and loved watching MSU sports. He was pretty much a regular guy, nothing, nothing exciting. In 1971, he married his wife, Marilyn Lee McClenaghan, who was originally from Detroit. From the outside looking in, and possibly for the first few years of their marriage, they were a relatively normal cookie cutter family. Marilyn worked as a guidance counselor at Coldwater High School, and she became quite popular with the students at the school. Dennis and Marilyn had three children together. They had two daughters and a son, Jennifer, Julie, and Scott. They seemed like a normal middle-class family, raising three healthy children together. But behind closed doors, Marilyn was not happy. It seemed that Dennis was becoming increasingly paranoid and controlling in their marriage. Dennis had quite a bad temper. He was moody and withdrawn and he would isolate himself from Marilyn and the kids, but then turn around and accuse Marilyn of turning the children against him. But in reality, it was Dennis's behavior. It was his moods, his gloomy presence, his temperament. And the kids noticed this. And like most people, the kids began distancing themselves from their own father. But Dennis believed it was all Marilyn's fault. She was feeding the kids lies and therefore he blamed her for turning the kids against him. After nearly two decades together, Marilyn had begun confiding in her friends and family about her marriage, about 
how unhappy she was in her marriage and how she had been unhappy for so long and how it was finally time to be happy. Their marriage at this point had turned loveless and was constantly argumentative. She confided in family members that she had begun thinking about divorce and how she had been thinking about this for quite some time. Then in early 1989, after 18 years of marriage, Marilyn, 48 years old at the time, finally filed for divorce from Dennis, who was 46 years old at the time. The divorce did not come as a surprise to any of their family and friends. Marilyn had told people that Dennis was a bully. Actually, the only person that was truly surprised by the divorce was Dennis himself. Marilyn got a lawyer to help facilitate the divorce, but she confided in her lawyer and she also was well aware that Dennis was not going to make this divorce happen easily. She knew that he would not let her make her own decisions and that he would try to ruin her life. He was super controlling and didn't want to accept the fact that his marriage was over. He didn't want to let Marilyn go. He didn't want to let his children go. He didn't want his family to end, especially after nearly 20 years together. However, during the negotiations, the divorce proceedings, Dennis acted really strangely. He let Marilyn have whatever she wanted financially. He offered it to her. He didn't fight for anything. And in December of 1989, the divorce was finalized. Although Marilyn did find this strange, she kind of just accepted it. She got the family house in the divorce where the kids and her continued living. Although the kids lived with Marilyn, they had joint custody of the children and he was granted visitation twice a week with his children. But the kids had already picked up on his odd behavior and were quite reluctant to even spend time with him. Now, as one can imagine, for a man as domineering and as controlling as Dennis was, this entire situation did not sit well with him. He began telling coworkers that he was angry and depressed and suicidal. And he was also contemplating murder. He was possibly becoming more unhinged than ever. Now, even though Dennis had no claim to the family home, it was Marilyn's. He was granted access to use the guest house, which is where he had his office. Even after the divorce was finalized, he continued using the space as his office. And people found that weird considering he didn't live at the home. You know, why not get a new office? But at the same time, he probably just wanted to be around his family often in a bid to control them and exercise his power and dominance by just being present. And because of this, because he was still always around, Marilyn changed all the locks on the family home because she was still scared of Dennis. Now, Dennis was only granted access to use the guest house freely so he could come and go as he pleased. And the guest house was separate from the family home. And despite this, one day Marilyn comes home from work and I believe no one was home at the time. It was just, it was empty. And she comes home, opens the door, and she sees Dennis just sitting there on the couch in the living room. She had changed the locks. Somehow he still found a way in. A few months had passed and it was now Easter, April 15th, 1990. Dennis arrives at the family home. It was his turn to be with the kids and he was due to pick them up. And I believe he was only going to be picking up two of the kids, the younger two, Julie and Scott. So because the kids were not a fan of their dad, when he asked them to get inside the car, Julie, the younger daughter, refused to go. She just didn't want to be with him. And this obviously triggered Dennis. So then Dennis goes inside to grab their son, Scott. And when he gets inside, he's kind of rough with Scott, kind of manhandling him and... Scott now changes his tune and he's kind of hesitant. Now he doesn't want to go. Then all three kids are kind of defending each other and nobody wants to go with Dennis. The kids did not want to be with their own father. And instead of Dennis looking at the situation and being like, my own kids don't want to be with me. You know, what's wrong? How can I address this issue? No, he gets pissed. So a fight erupts between Dennis and the children. And obviously Marilyn joins in. She's defending the kids, trying to explain the situation to Dennis. 
Dennis, already angry, now turns around and starts yelling at Marilyn. It's her fault. You know, she turned the kids against him. The kids didn't want to spend time with him. The kids were disobeying their father, refusing to come with him. It's all her fault. As Marilyn is trying to talk to Dennis, she's trying to diffuse the situation, you know, calm things down. Dennis becomes completely unhinged. He grabs Marilyn, punches her before throwing her down the staircase. The children were completely horrified as their father then proceeded to beat the living daylights out of their mother at the bottom of the staircase where she was already clearly injured. The children begged their father to stop and he just ignored them before Jennifer ran to the neighbor's house to call for help. When Jennifer returns back to the house, she sees her father dragging her mother to his car. As he's doing this, he tells the children, you know, I'm gonna take your mom to the hospital. And then he drives off. But they never arrive at any hospital. No emergency department ever gets a visit from them. Following this, as the police were notified about what happened, an immediate search for them begins. That same day, a couple by the name of Ray and Marie Thornton were out for a Sunday drive on Snow Prairie Road near Coldwater. Now, some sources say that they were brother and sister, which is weird to me because on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries where they talk about this case, they are interviewed and they refer to themselves as a couple. So I'm like, I doubt a TV show would have gotten that wrong. So I'm assuming that they were a couple and not brother and sister. This drive had become a weekly tradition for them. They would drive off into the country and play games to pass the time. One of the games that they would play was to create words out of license plates. And on this particular day, Easter, they're playing this game. They're out on this kind of abandoned road. And suddenly a green Chevrolet van appears behind them and starts driving super aggressively. Ray notices this van appear in his rear view mirror and he's like, oh my God, this guy is so aggressive. And then this van eventually overtakes them. As the van passes them, Marie notices that the license plate begins with a GZ. And continuing playing the game, she goes, geez, that guy must be in a hurry. And after this, they just brush off the incident and then keep driving. Several minutes down that same road, they come across this green Chevrolet van again. This time the van is pulled over by an abandoned schoolhouse. The van was sort of on the side of the schoolhouse parked between the building and this big tank. As they're driving past, Marie sees the driver, a man, and he's holding what appears to be a bloodied sheet. And she realizes that this is the same van that was being aggressive and had overtaken them earlier. So at this point, they're kind of spooked, right? But they keep driving because they're not really sure what they just saw. And then just a few minutes later, the same van appears behind them, but is now riding their tail. So at this point, Marie's like, no, no, no. We need to report this guy to the police. He's way too aggressive. So she grabs a piece of paper and attempts to get the rest of his license plate. Remember, all she had was the GC. Now, Ray, he's driving the car. He begins to get really nervous because this van has been tailing them for nearly two miles. So he decides it's the best to just move out of the way. So he pulls off onto a side road. As he does this, he pulls off onto like this left road and he notices that the van just pulls up a little bit ahead and stops on that original road they were driving on. Now they hadn't gotten the full license plate of this van and they really wanted to report him to the police because he was just being a douchebag. So they decide, okay, we just need to turn around and go quickly look at the van. So now they're driving back on that same road and they're approaching the van. As they approach the van, they notice that the driver has gotten out and is now at the back of the van and appears to be changing the license plate. His passenger door at this point is wide open and Marie sees a horrific sight. The entire passenger door is covered in blood. So now they're like, okay, something bad definitely happened. We need to report him to the police. But before doing that, they drive back to the abandoned schoolhouse. Now this is super brave to me because I'm like, there's no chance I would be driving 
to that area knowing that this driver is in the vicinity, like there's zero chance, but they, I guess, wanted to just be sure that something was off before just making this accusation to the police. So they drive back to the abandoned schoolhouse. They go to the side that Marie had seen the driver on and they're walking super carefully. They don't want to stumble across anything, you know, and disturb it. And they just wanted to confirm what this white thing was that Marie had seen. So they carefully walk around the area and they approach what appears to be an animal hole. Stuffed inside this animal hole, they see a white sheet sticking out of it that is completely covered in blood and flesh. I mean, what are the odds that this couple witnessed this driver committing a horrific crime? So they immediately contact Michigan State Police to let them know what they had just found. What they didn't know was at that very moment, the police were on the hunt for Dennis and his injured wife, Marilyn. They had received Jennifer's frantic call and they knew they had to find this couple quickly. After contacting the police, Ray and Marie learned that the driver of that green van was in fact Dennis. So what happened to Marilyn? When Dennis dragged an injured Marilyn outside of her home, he coaxed her into his van, telling her that he was going to be taking her to the hospital to help her. Once she was inside his van, he shot his wife in the back of the head, killing her. He then wrapped her body in a sheet, drove to an abandoned church and dumped her body behind the building. He then drove to the abandoned schoolhouse and stuffed that bloodied white sheet down an animal hole to get rid of evidence. And that is what Ray and Marie saw him doing. I mean, what are the odds that they witnessed this? What if no one had seen him? Police arrived to the schoolhouse, assuming at this point that Marilyn is no longer alive. They blocked off the area and took the bloodied sheet into evidence. At the scene, they also found tire tracks that matched Dennis's van. The next day, April 16th, 1990, a highway worker discovered a dead body lying on the side of a deserted road. It was Marilyn, and this road was midway between the schoolhouse and her home. Dennis was now officially a wanted fugitive. A few days after the murder, Dennis sent multiple bizarre rambling letters to friends, family, and coworkers in an effort to justify Marilyn's death. He sent a total of 17 postmarked in Virginia, Iowa, and Oklahoma. In these letters, he ranted about how Marilyn was a bad wife and how she had tricked him. In one of the letters, he wrote, Marilyn had many, many opportunities to treat me fairly during this divorce, and she chose to string it out, trick me, lie to me. And when you lose your wife, children, and home, there's not much left. I was too old to start over. Three months after Marilyn's murder, Dennis sent another letter. This time it was 13 pages in length, quoted verses from the Bible and contained more rambles from Dennis. He was a wanted man at this point, but he was on the run and police failed to track him down. I believe the three kids at this point were living with their grandparents and the entire family was distraught over what took place, the death of their mother at the hands of their father. On March 20th, 1991, the TV show Unsolved Mysteries aired a segment on Marilyn's death. In this segment, her kids, friends, and family were all interviewed about the tragedy that took place. Now, because Dennis was a wanted man at the time the segment aired, at the very end, they provided a description of Dennis saying that he was six feet tall, 200 pounds, dark brown hair, deep set eyes. That same evening, a woman named Mary, who lived in Dallas, Texas, had just come home from work. She saw her boyfriend's car sitting in the driveway, which was unusual because he normally parked it in the garage. When she got inside, her boyfriend, his name was Hank Queen, was rushing around inside and telling her that he needed to leave immediately. He had an emergency trip to take because his mother was extremely sick. As he was rushing around, you know, packing everything, she noticed Hank 
was keeping one eye on the TV show Unsolved Mysteries. He was packing up his clothes and other items and telling her to pack him some sandwiches and cans of soda for his long journey. It seemed he wanted to keep her distracted in the kitchen, away from the TV, where this episode of Unsolved Mysteries was playing, the second half, which would outline the description of a wanted man, a man named Dennis DePew, wanted for the murder of his ex-wife. As Hank said his goodbyes to Mary and drove off in his green Chevrolet van, Mary had this odd feeling that she was never gonna see him again. As you can guess, Hank Queen was really Dennis DePew. Now the reason that Dennis drove off in such a rush and was so frantic is because he was worried that one of Mary's friends was gonna watch the show, watch the segment and recognize him and rat him out to the police. And he was damn right because one of Mary's friends did recognize Dennis from the show and gave his new fake Texas license plate number to the Texas police. Later that night, Mary had learned that her boyfriend Hank Queen was really Dennis DePew and that he was featured on this segment, that he was wanted for the murder of his wife. Dennis drove for four frantic hours into Louisiana and then across the Mississippi border. Louisiana state troopers had spotted Dennis's van and he led them on a 15 mile high speed chase, refusing to be pulled over. All neighboring law enforcement were informed to just lay in wait, waiting for Dennis to pass by. When Dennis broke through two police barricades in Warren County in Mississippi, the police were just like, whoever's near him, just shoot out both his front tires. Officers missed the two front tires, but they got the two back tires. Dennis fired shots at officers, trying to ram them off the road as his car eventually pulled to a stop. As officers approached his van, Dennis turned the gun on himself and took his own life. Officers say he was found dead with the 357 Magnum in his left hand and his thumb on the trigger. The bullet wound had entered his mouth and exited the back of his head and police were sure that it was a suicide because their bullets would have never gone in that direction. Dennis's van was full of clothes and boxes of his belongings. Dennis was buried at Eagle Cemetery in LaGrange County, Indiana far, far away from his wife Marilyn's resting place, which was in Oakland County, Michigan. The story of Marilyn DePew's murder is thought to be the inspiration behind the opening scene of the movie Jeepers Creepers. I think it's important to note though, however, that the director of the movie, Victor Salva, as well as his writers, stated that it was not inspired by this case, but the similarities are quite unbelievable. So while that fact cannot be confirmed, I have to say though that using this tragic murder and connecting it with a horror movie like Jeepers Creepers is kind of clickbaity, it's kind of gross, but it seems that everywhere online, people are believing that it is connected. I mean, I do understand though why people are saying it's so similar because they're playing the game in the car. They get chased by this van looking thing and they see this guy dumping, you know, something in a white sheet down this pipe. It is very similar. So if it's not inspired, it's like super coincidental. This case though is just so tragic. At the end of the day, you know, an entire family's existence was ended in a way because of a man who possibly needed treatment. His anger and control issues were a wild beast on their own. And due to this three Children lost both their parents. Dennis DePew was afraid of losing his family. This divorce was gonna cause a breakup and divide. You know, Marilyn was causing this divide, right? But ultimately, who destroyed his entire family? It was you, Dennis. What do you guys think of today's case? Let me know down in the comments below. And thank you so much to Giselle Brooks again for recommending this case. And I will see you in next week's video, guys. Besitos. Bye.